Hi folks, can I have your attention please? I'm David Douglas, Dean of the Faculty and Vice President for Academic Affairs, and I'm just delighted to welcome you to this adjusting microphone uh, and uh, a session on progress through reflection sponsored by the Afro Club. Uh, and the, my very clear instructions in beginning this event um, had to do with not speaking much. And I suspect that came from Professor Kim because she seems like the person that were most likely to give me very direct and useful advice about not speaking too much. Um, and what I had in mind to say in 30 seconds or less was really the legacy of MLK. You remember at his assassination in Memphis, he was supporting the garbage man strike. The last project that he worked on was the Poor People Project. The legacy of King started with racial relations, but it extended so much farther. And this opportunity to learn through reflection on how his legacy affects each of us in our own lived experience is just a unique experience, I hope, for every one of us to consider, lo, 50 years later, what that legacy means for us as a collective, as a community, and individually. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderators, Irvin and Becky. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for coming here because we know you had so many different commitments and I know some of you four went to class just to be here. And so thank you for just being here because that's very important to us. Uh, the panel, like he said, is titled Progress Through Reflection. And that's because there is no denial how far we've come as a country and as a people. We've come from olden times of lynching, public place segregation. You can name so many of them. but. Uh, my question is, is that enough today, it's 2019? Should we still have people trampled on because of their skin color, their gender, and so on? Should we still fear to be comfortable in our bodies, in our orientations, and in our races? These are all things to reflect upon, and our panel consists of different people with unique stories to share, and I urge that you listen and give them all your attention, and give, give yourself a chance to learn something new today. We're not here to live with consecutive answers, but more questions because we're supposed to incite dialogue after this, and that's very important. Please feel free to uh, ask wise questions, think wisely, and be considerate of your neighbors. Uh, just a brief background, my name is Becky, and I'm from Uganda. It's a small country in East Africa, and I had never heard of Martin Luther King up until uh, 2008 elections when Obama won and that was quite an uproar in my country as well because it was almost dumb and impossible to believe that a black person had won an election in the United States and that was a big thing for us as well because we're like wow and what I took from this was later in the evening on the news they were quoting Martin Luther King and just praising how his movement and his fight for civil rights made it possible for people like Obama to dream, people like us just being here, just being able to dream because people like him went out there and fought for us. And so uh, I would like to also say he brought people together and with others they fought for equality and freedom for everyone. So we choose to commemorate today so that we remind people there was a civil rights movement because it's such a shame that some people choose to forget that there was such a time in our lives and in this country. And so we refuse to forget the likes of Martin Luther and the rest. And so thank you, we ask that you just pay attention and listen. And so with no further words, I'll just hand it over to everyone. Thank you, um, Becky and David Douglas, for um, introducing us to this panel today. And now I have the amazing job of introducing our panelists, who we are here to engage with and provide us with such information today. So um, starting off first, uh, we have Lisa Sanchez from the Boise City Council. And um, she's a very distinguished woman, so I'm going to give you some of her highlights as I can, <laughs> just by looking at it, I can't simply ex describe her in the short time that I have here. But um, she was selected from a pool of over, over, over 100 applicants to serve as the sole bilingual civil rights investigator for the entire state of Idaho from 2008 and 2013 at the Idaho Human Rights Commission. She has served as the bilingual case coordinator 
for the Idaho Volunteer Lawyers Program. She, is, she has served as the bilingual admissions counselor for the Jobs Corp and Dynamic Educational Systems Incorporated. She's also served as the bilingual civil rights investigator, as I said, for the Idaho Human Rights Commission. <laughs> um, she received her Bachelor of Arts um, in Communication from the Boise State University. Um, she, is volunteer, she is a volunteer at the Boise City Department of Arts and History as the Cultural Grant Reviewer. And she's also um, volunteers as the board of, on the Board of Directors and Director at Large for the Girl Scouts of, Sil of the Silver Sage Council. And she's also the Secretary for the Boise State University Latino Alumni Chapter. And as I said before, there are too many accomplishments here to tell you in my short time. But ladies and gentlemen, Lisa, Chan Lisa Sanchez. Van Beechler grew up in northern Idaho and relocated to the Treasure Valley to finish school. She's active in the Idaho democratic politics uh, with progressive causes such as updating the Idaho Human Rights Act and Medicaid redesign. She and her fiance, Chelsea Gano Lincoln, are in the process of relocating to Caldwell. As chair of the LGBTA Democratic Caucus, Van has traveled the state for the past two years training activists on how to engage legislators on gay and trans transgender issues. She has worked as a developmental disabilities agency clinical supervisor for a behavior health company for 11 years. Ladies and gentlemen, Van Beachley. Um, for our students, um, for those of you should be familiar with Mie, but for those of you who are not, this is Mie Kim. <laughs> um, she has a PhD in Latin American and World History from the Washington State University. She has a Master's of Arts in U.S. History from the Washington State University and a Master of, Master's of Arts in American Studies from the University of Notre Dame. And she got a Bachelor's in Arts at San, San Jose State University. She started teaching at the College of Idaho in 2001. Her areas of specialization are in Asian immigration and Asian immigrant experiences in Mexico from the late 19th to, 20, to early 20th century, particularly in Baja California Norte. Currently, she's currently working on citizenship, race, and interracial marriages in the American West. She also teaches a variety of courses from introductory level world civilization to advanced level courses, including revolutionary Mexico, Cuba, pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, liberation theology, and others. Ladies and gentlemen, Mia Kim. And last but definitely not least, Aurora, Aurora Corsart. She is a math physics major. She is the dear treasure of the International Student Organization. <laughs> and she is also the founding co-president of the Interfaith Council and president of Math Club on this campus. She's also a wonderful human being and a treasure to work with. Ladies and gentlemen, Aurora Kosar. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. So, um, anybody can go first. I'm going first. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much uh, for, to Arnold Hernandez for inviting me to be a panelist today. Uh, Martin Luther King Day is very special to me uh, because uh, I grew up in Burley, Idaho. I don't know if anybody knows where Burley is, uh, but it was a world away from Boise State University. And growing up in Burley, I grew up in a farm worker, house, farm worker background. Um, you know, I was raised by my mother and my maternal grandmother. And um, uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to get involved in school beyond just going to class. I didn't have uh, the privilege uh, to be able to be involved in extracurricular activities at school. I had to work to help support our family. So I was very selfish when it came time to go to Boise State University on the camp scholarship, the College Assistance Migrant Program. I wanted to do all the things that I couldn't do when I was in high school. 
And so when I got to Boise State, the first thing I did was pick up the Arbiter news, student newspaper, and on the back page is where they had announcements. And there was an announcement that said, um, today at two o'clock in the student union building, such and such conference room, Martin Luther King Jr. planning committee, everyone welcome. And I'm like, everyone, that's me. I'm invited to this. So I went and I walked into this conference room and thought I'd immediately made a mistake because I walked in and there was this really big long conference table surrounded by white men in suits. And I thought, I, and there I am with my BSU sweatshirt and my backpack and my 501 button flies, which was what we wore back then, and my high tops. And I felt completely out of place. But then I looked at the head of that table and the person leading the meeting was a young man who would become my mentor. And he was a student, his name was Eric Love. Um, he was African American, grew up in Mountain Home. And so there's Eric standing at the head of the table with his daishiki and his top knot leading the meeting. So I waited till the meeting was over because I didn't understand the language that was being spoken. It was English, but at a very high level. And after everyone left, I went up to Eric and I said, how can I help? And he said, are you involved with Mecha? So Mecha is an organization. Mecha stands for Movimiento Estudiantil de Chicanos de Aslan. And I said, yes, I'm with Mecha. He goes, I would like for you to be the liaison between this planning committee and Mecha. I want you to ask Andy Rodriguez, who was the president of Mecha, I want you to ask Andy if Mecha will pay for the printing costs of the napkins for the banquet. Oh, dear Jesus, I was a liaison. <laughs> and that was my very first step towards activism. And so for me, um, this day is so special because it created an opportunity to become part of my community to contribute. And even in that small, tiny way, but most importantly, uh, the way Eric mentored me was to make, to make sure that as I moved forward in my own activism, in my own leadership, that I made room for people to contribute because it can be very intimidating. Um, I had no idea, Eric had no idea, Martin Luther King Jr. had no idea, he had a dream that someone like me, um, someone who comes from a humble background, who who comes from a community where folks like myself were expected to always work in the fields, to always work in a, in a factory, at the Simplot Potato Factory in Hayburn, which is where most of my family and neighbors worked. Um, that, was, that was the future that was laid out for us. Um, but these folks thought, you know, it might start off with getting the napkins printed for the banquet, but maybe it'll end up in some history-making moments where someone like Lisa will think that she is capable of running for office and that she will make history in Boise, Idaho by being the first Latina to run for office and to secure a seat on the Boise City Council. So. We'll just go down the line. Uh, my name is Van Beechler. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to myself. Uh, I actually grew up in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, uh, the Deep South is what I like to call it. Um, our first introduction, I have a twin sister, so I like to speak in plurals, so I apologize if you're wondering who the hour is. Um, so we grew up uh, in the Deep South uh, in the 80s, great times, let me tell you. Um, our first introduction to Martin Luther King Day um, and Dr. King was completely whitewashed and I'm really hesitant to be up here. I do need to tell you that because I feel like as a white woman, um, I feel like I'm kind of co-opting this day by being here, but I was invited um, and I am a gay woman so I do face discrimination, but I just wanted to preface that here. Um, I am very fortunate to be here. Um, but you know, I grew up in a time where um, racial segregation segregation was by choice. Um, it was it was after the '60s. Everything was was um, integrated at that point. But I went to an all-white school. Um, 
and I went and lived in an all white neighborhood in a city where that was 75% black. Um, and I can tell you that um, my implicit biases were ingrained in me. Um, we moved to North Idaho when I was in high school, lived up in Coeur d'Alene, um, and that was the height of the Aryan Nation uh, stuff going on up there. Um, and I learned real quick um, about those, those biases that I grew up with, especially when I moved from a city that was primarily um, based this large immigrant population to a super, super, super white North Idaho um, and didn't quite understand and didn't quite uh, know where I was placed. Fast forward, going to college, um, I came down to Boise State, uh, got my bachelor's, my first one from there. Um, and as a lot of people do, it was the late 90s, um, and I realized that I was gay. <laughs> but I was terrified to come out, even in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, because I, I watched uh, friends and that did, did come out, and uh, they were put under a lot of scrutiny um, and made fun of, and they were scared. And so I waited till after I graduated college, in 2004, and I came out. And in 2004, um, in Idaho, we had uh, we had uh, Nicola Favor in the state legislature. Um, she might have, yeah, I think it was 2004 when she was elected. Uh, and then in 2006, there was this uh, amendment, the Idaho Constitution, to make traditional marriage between a man and woman. Um, and there was a large group of uh, LGBT people, we like to say gay or transgender. Um, LGBTs can be confusing if you don't know what it stands for. Um, that uh, were scared. <laughs> and we looked at the Idaho Human Rights Act and we saw that there was something missing and it was sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so there were there was a few years in there where there was a lot of us that were lobbying the state legislature um, to update the Idaho Human, right, uh, Human Rights Act to include sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, that turned into add the words, um, which some of you may be familiar with. We I remember when we were looking for a name for this campaign, we were like, we just want to add these four words. We just want to add the words, and it became the campaign for for add the words. And after a few years. Um, of lobbying the legislature, um, pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, like, hey, sexual orientation, gender identity, please include this. We're looking for a mechanism for us to be able to um, lodge complaints uh, if, if we're discriminated against. And that's basically what we're missing, right? Um, and that, and that didn't happen and still hasn't happened to this day. But in 2013, my wife and I, actually, the Yote, Chelsea Lincoln, um, we met when we started this LGBT caucus. We decided that we were no longer going to, um, well, we're gonna continue to lobby legislatures, but we're gonna take a different lens and we're gonna try to elect people that already believe that, um, that we're humans, basically, that we can be added into the human, Idaho Human Rights Act. Um, and so we started the caucus in 2013, um, and we started touring the state, uh, going around, doing messaging training on how to talk to family, friends, uh, legislators, policymakers, city council people, on how to talk about gay and transgender issues in a way that is less scary and very, very personal. Um, so that we can start to change minds. And we were also looking for people that um, possibly would want to run for office um, that supported us. And so we hit everywhere. We went Sandpoint, we hit uh, Grangeville, Lewiston, Moscow, Nampa, Caldwell. We did Boise, clearly, Twin Falls. We did Idaho Falls, um, Sun Valley, Haley. We went over to Pocatello. And we were on our own dime, we were doing this. Um, and we contacted the Human Rights com Campaign and we contacted the Equality Federation and, and they were helping us, they gave us the information. Um, and we met a ton of people across the state were, that were really interested, but while we were touring, we realized we were meeting people, um, not just people that were interested in gay and transgender issues, but people that were educators and religious groups um, and uh, people that were interested in civil rights. And we're really hesitant to compare um, 
our battle with uh, the civil rights um, of the 60s because I mean we I am not a person of color and I don't uh, I don't I'm very hesitant to compare those two things uh, so basically we started this caucus started uh, touring the state um, my wife and I, we both ran for uh, state legislature in this last election. I ran for Senate. She ran for House in District 10. So we actually live across the street uh, on Cleveland Boulevard from the college. And um, there's been a lot of progress. In 2014, we uh, were allowed to marry because of a Supreme Court case. But in the majority of Idaho, um, we can still be kicked out of our homes or denied service or employment for being gay. Now, we're super fortunate because we own our home. Um, Caldwell's one of those cities. There's a lot of uh, non-discrimination non -discrimination ordinances that have gone across the state um, that have certain cities, Boise's one of them, um, Coeur d'Alene's one of them, Meridian just passed it, so they have protections. Caldwell does not. Um, so there's been some progress. Um, not, not a lot, but like I said, Chelsea and I both ran for state legislature, um, and for the first time, we were very surprised. We were uh, endorsed by the Idaho Press Tribune, and they were very open about us being a married couple in Caldwell, where we don't have protections. So um, there's a lot of, there's definitely a lot of progress going on. Uh, I know I moved from Boise, I was terrified to move out to Caldwell without that non-discrimination ordinance, but Chelsea, my wife, some of you may know her, is super tough, and she's like, we're gonna do this, we're gonna trailblaze out there, and I'm like, okay. Um, and so that's what we're doing. We're out here building our family. We just had a son. He turned six months last week. He's the cutest baby you've ever seen in your life. I'm, I'll show you pictures later. But, um, but that's, that's, that's kind of our story and, and why I'm here today. So thanks for having me. So Arnold, um, is it on? Oh, it's on. So Arnold told me five minutes. Um, was I? I think, no, I, no, it's because he wants me, because I talk okay. too much. Um, so, I, so I wrote mine down, because I have never been able to speak for five minutes. I have it down to five minutes and 30 seconds. Okay. I've, I've worked on this. OK. Um, so I'm speaking both as, um, this is in part my own sort of personal reflection, but um, I also can't really remove myself as a historian. Um, so this is sort of a, a weaving of those two ideas. Um, so on January, uh, January 15, 2019, would have been Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 90th birthday. And across the country today, political, religious, educational, and community leaders will mark, um, mark the day by invoking Dr. King's most famous speech. And there will be calls to remember the struggles of the civil rights movement and the dream of a more just world. On social media, many of you have probably already seen this, many of our friends are already posting their favorite Dr. King quotes. Many will note how far we have come and also argue that in this fractured and seemingly broken political culture, we should not politicize Dr. King, that we should take this day to come together to remember his words. I agree with the sentiment that we must remember Dr. King, but I also believe that we must be intentional in our reflections and in our pursuit of a just world. Dr. King's August 1963 speech at the Lincoln Memorial is a powerful reminder of the struggles of the civil rights movement. Dr. King's dream of a world where people are judged by the content of their character touches many because, as Dr. King argued, it is deeply rooted in the American dream. It is woven in the stories of the revolution, the civil war, and the civil rights movement. And his words continue to inspire many contemporary activists attempting to affect socio-political and cultural changes. Dr. King's dream is woven into this nation's DNA. At the same time, we tend to, more often than not, focus our attention on a snippet of his 1963 speech. We seem to have forgotten the historical Dr. King before and after August 1963. What do I mean by this? Well, by doing the above, we tend to romanticize this message and interpret his pacifism as passivity. And nothing could be further from the truth. Dr. King was a radical and a revolutionary. His pacifism was not born of naivety. He did not simply turn the other cheek. While incarcerated in Birmingham jail, Dr. King rejected those who argued for continued negotiation. Instead, he called for nonviolent direct action to create, as he said, tension. 
He called for direct action as a moral imperative to address the horrific racial violence that plagued American society, a society that accepted daily violence against African Americans, of legal and social segregation, of unequal access to public, and public services and education, a society that accepted as norm the denial of citizenship, civil rights, and basic justice to African Americans. He called on Americans to act because as he observed, quote, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Dr. King understood the urgency of the moment, and he argued that 1963 was not an end, but a beginning of the long struggle for justice. Dr. King also understood that while racism was America's original sin, he believed that racial injustice was often compounded by economic inequalities. In 1965, when President Lyndon Johnson declared war on poverty, 19% of Americans, that was 35 million people at the time, lived below the poverty line. Dr. King recognized that poverty cut across race and geography and called for a united front made up of Native Americans, Mexican Americans, white Appalachians, and others to join the coalition of a poor people's campaign that would march on Washington in May 1968 to demand funding for full employment, guaranteed annual income, anti-poverty programs, and housing for the poor. Dr. King was assassinated a month before the march, but his calls for economic, racial, and social justice is as relevant today as it was in the 1960s. As we remember, and as we, all of us in here, remember and reflect on Dr. King, there is much to celebrate, but we must not become complacent. Race relations has improved, but racism still persists. The Southern Poverty Law Center estimates that there are currently over 900 hate groups in the United States. In 2017, the FBI recorded over 7,000 hate crimes. The FBI also estimates that annually over 250,000 people, that's a quarter of a million people, are victims of hate crimes. While marriage equality passed in 2015, crimes against LGBTQ populations has risen every single year since 2014. Finally, despite an extraordinary period of economic growth, an estimated 43 million Americans, around 14% live in poverty today. For a family of poor, poverty means an income of less than $24,563. That is the break. Almost 80% of full-time workers live paycheck to paycheck. And this is evident right now with the shutdown of how many Americans who are furloughed are not able to pay their mortgage and they are not able to pay their bills. While the number of citizens of seniors living in poverty has dropped, 21% of all children, that is one out of every five, live in poverty in the US. After decades of desegregation, there is evidence that segregation based on race and income is returning in some parts of the country. So then what can be done and what should we do? Dr. King recognized that the struggle for justice requires vigilance and action. To dream for justice is not enough, to be woke is not enough. The time, for act, the time to act for justice is always now. In that spirit, I leave you with Dr. King's call to action from the Lincoln Memorial. He said, quote, we have come to this hollowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. There is, this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Thank you. So I also was worried about the five minute limit, so I also wrote mine down. On this day, why do we talk about interfaith leadership? What does religion, or lack thereof, have to do with Martin Luther King Jr. or the legacy and the ongoing struggle for social justice? To address this, I would ask you to consider your own experience. First, consider in history or in your own life how religion, or lack thereof, has been used as a tool of oppression, a means to segregate, to terrorize, to conquer and divide. Then consider how a person's faith or non-faith status might make them a target of discrimination and violence. Now consider how faith, spirituality, and philosophy 
might empower and encourage, and how institutions dedicated to these beliefs might organize around issues of social justice. Finally, consider all these instances together. What we see is three versions of the same story. All have been true, often simultaneously, throughout human history. The difference today is that we largely live closer together and interact with people outside of our immediate families more now than at any other time in human history. This is what Reverend King called the great new problem of mankind. We've inherited a large house, he wrote, a great world house in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interest, who because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. So how do we, the inhabitants of this world house, learn to live together? How can we overcome centuries of separation and conflict to become not just neighbors, but family? This question makes me think of my own family and of the experiences which have brought me to pursue interfaith leadership. My brother Ace is 17 years old, and he has Down syndrome and autism. In effect, this means he doesn't talk very much, mostly individual words and phrases and sometimes very short sentences. When he was in his mid-teens, there was a period where he hardly used any words at all. He would mostly grunt to tell us when he was annoyed, which, since he was a teenager, was pretty much all of the time. <laughs> I'm a very verbal person, so it was difficult for me to connect with someone who I couldn't communicate with verbally. And for a time, I wrote him off. And then I came to college. And suddenly, not only could we not communicate well verbally, but I couldn't be there with him in person. No picking him up from school, no hugs, no bedtime stories, nothing. And that experience made me realize just how much I was craving that connection. I wanted to reach through all that silence and to understand what he was thinking and feeling. I remember one night we were driving together and it was dark outside and I was minding my own business when I heard Ace out of nowhere say, moon. And I looked out through the window and I saw this big harvest moon shine very brightly. It was beautiful and I wouldn't have noticed it. But what stuck out to me was that Ace had just said something of his own volition. That hadn't happened in months. Still to this day, when, it, oh, and he wasn't responding to a prompt. He was just telling me about the world as he saw it. And still to this day, whenever I look at the moon, I always think of my brother. My relationship with Ace has shown me what it means to fight to be with another person. So it's not a big jump to make to interfaith leadership. Interfaith cooperation is about understanding another person's way of seeing the world, while acknowledging that it's different from yours. It's about building bridges and learning new languages so that we can reach across silence and connect with other human beings. Ultimately, it's about building the kind of world we all want to live in. It's reuniting our world family. This is a process that starts here and now. As I mentioned, my understanding of my own values and desires has really come into focus in the last few years. And as a part of that process, I've had the chance to work with an amazing group of people, to, of students and mentors, to form an interfaith council here at CFI. This group is less than a year old. It's very tightly knit and compassionate and Together, we've been able to really tackle and negotiate with really complicated issues of identity and culture and religion. So in the remaining time, I believe we're going into the Q&A section, I would invite and welcome all of you to ask any questions you may have about our process, about what we're doing and thinking, and about where we can go from here. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your experiences and stories. Um, as Rara said, now we're into our Q&A section. So um, just simply raise your hands and you will be acknowledged and um, just stand and present your question to the panelists for discussion. So not everybody go at once.
all of those things. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's hard when you are entering a, a, a new space and you are trailblazing, as Van mentioned, uh, because you have nothing to compare it to. And so um, you don't know what's normal. And so it, it takes some time to reflect and to absorb what's been happening. But um, uh, even the, the challenging parts are actually uh, very encouraging, and that may sound strange, but uh, what happens is when you enter a space and, uh, and you feel perhaps that you're not as welcomed as you thought you might be, um, what you recognize is that, well, then that's why I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be here to trouble the water a little bit, and um, I, I happen to be a woman of faith, and so I, I never truly feel alone, because God's with me, always. Um, and it's in those moments that I recognize um, why I'm here. Um, I am also a survivor of childhood sex abuse. And uh, I, I love art. I think sometimes um, art is sent to us to teach us, uh, whether it's poetry or, or cinema or literature or music. Um, and for me, I remember reading uh, several years ago the book, The Lovely Bones. I don't know if you're familiar with that. You've probably seen the movie. The movie's bad. The book's good. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book. Uh, the narrator of the book, The Lovely Bones, happens to be the ghost of 13-year-old Susie Salmon, who is abducted by her neighbor, uh, sexually assaulted and murdered and disappeared. Her family never knows what happens to her. And until I read that story, I never re recognized my good fortune and only having been molested. I, I never realized how blessed I was that I wasn't murdered, that I wasn't left in the desert of Arizona for my family never to know what happened to me. And so be once I recognized that, I realized that my job, my second chance at life, means that I have to do difficult things. And for me, that is telling the truth when nobody else will tell the truth. And um, once I've em embraced that as my life's mission, um, it, it's, it's made it so in those moments that are difficult uh, that I recognize that it brings me back to my purpose. I'm not supposed to be here to be comfortable. And I'm not purposely trying to make others uncomfortable just to be provocative. It's because we have to tell the truth. And so when I, when I ran for office, I talked about all the things that we're not supposed to talk about. We're not supposed to talk about our failures. Um, we're not supposed to talk about the time when we were furloughed 10 years ago at the Human Rights Commission because the governor wanted to get rid of our agency and some others, um, and which put me further behind on my mortgage payment, which made it so that I had to sell my blood at the Biomat on Overland in Boise just to try to make my mortgage payment, to try to put gas in the car. Because 10 years ago, the gas prices were through the roof. Some of you may not remember that, some of you do. And I remember one day when I found myself running on fumes, and I had to pull over at the nearest gas station, and by then, people were gassing and dashing. They were so desperate. People would put, put gas in their car and, and leave without paying, so the gas stations changed their policy. If you were paying with cash, you had to do that first. So I remember going into the gas station with my wallet, knowing there was no folding money in there, and whatever, was, whatever change was gonna come out of my wallet is how much gas was gonna go in the car. And so I remember that. I remember dumping my wallet onto the counter, and uh, I saw this little hand reach over and drop two or three bucks on top of my pile of change, and it was a skater kid. And he said, gas is expensive, miss. That's why I ride a skateboard. God bless. <laughs> and in that moment, it, it, that is one of the lowest and most hopeful moments of my life. It was low because here I am, I'm in my 30s, I have a college degree, I speak two languages, I've always held professional work, I have a home, I have a car, but in that moment, none of that mattered. What mattered was that I needed somebody in my community to show me grace. And it was hopeful 
because it meant when this young man gave me two or three bucks so that I could get one gallon of gas, um, what it signaled to me was that someone in our community was raising a child to be that observant, conscientious, and kind and generous to help somebody, to recognize that somebody within their reach needed help, and that person was me. And so, so for me, what I recognize is, you know, the way I have to honor that is I have to do the thing that nobody else is willing to do, and that is to tell stories like that, to tell what it was to, to, to struggle to make my house payment while I was working at the Human Rights Commission, uh, to talk about the sad decision to have to file for bankruptcy. So that is my job on city council as well, when we're making these decisions. And I know that I'm sitting with other people who, they're very different from me. Um, they're all homeowners, uh, they're all married, and they have children, and they have jobs where, um, you know, having a, uh, having an, uh, having a, a bill that you didn't count on would not be devastating to them. But to me, it would be. And I firmly believe that the people, the t over 10,000 people that voted for me to be in office in 2017, I feel what they were saying to the city of Boise was, we want one of us. We want one of our kind. And not necessarily a, a Mexican woman, but the working poor. That's who I am. So Arnold, no, I've not been welcomed <laughs> in the same way that somebody who is um, of that world would be welcomed. Um, I have a very dear friend of mine who is a leader in Boise say to me, and he happens to be a white man, he says, Lisa, you scare us. And, and I said, why do I scare you? He goes, because Lisa, I'm a white man. And I like to think that I work very, very hard for what I have and for all my accomplishments. But because of you accomplishing what you've accomplished, you're signaling to me that you're stronger than me because you've had more obstacles to overcome than I have. And that is a hard realization to accept, that there were paths that were a little bit easier for me because I'm a white man. He goes, somebody else could have created what I created, but it would have been that much harder if they were a woman of color, if they were somebody living with a disability, if they were somebody who was not straight. So I'm thinking it's, I'm not supposed to be welcomed. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like a drive. <laughs> Were, yeah. Well, it was interesting because when I moved there in 92, um, which was in the <laughs> governor, we had Governor Andrus, Democratic governor. Um, we actually, I'm, I come from, I'm, I'm also vice chair of the Idaho Democratic Party, so I come from a very democratic lens. You need to know that when I talk about politics. Mm -hmm. um, so when I moved there, we actually had a, a, quite a few Democratic uh, legislatures up in North Idaho. Um, and we had Mary Lou Reed, we had Mary Lou Shepard, um, quite, quite a few of them up there. And so um, when, when I moved there, it wasn't as conservative as it is now. It really, the pendul pendulum really did swing um, to the right. Um, but, what, but seeing that, because I moved to Boise in 2000, I went to North Idaho College, got my associates, and then was like, oh, I gotta do something with my life, I should pro probably finish my bachelor's. Um, and so of course I moved down here and got my art degree, because that was brilliant. Um, painting, <laughs> I'm gonna be a painter, it's gonna be lucrative. Um, uh, so it's interesting, um, 
I remember when I came to visit, I actually came down to the 2000 was the Idaho State Democratic Convention here at College of Idaho. So College of Idaho was my first introduction to Southern Idaho um, in 2000 and I went and we stayed on the ca campus of C of I, but I went and visited Boise State. I, I know, like looking back now, I'm like, this is so weird. Um, ended up going to Boise State, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's super conservative now, but back then in the 90s, uh, there was a large group of like liberal progressives, and the majority of them are white people. There's no diversity in North Idaho. Um, comparatively to Southern Idaho or any other place I've lived. Um, and, but there was this, uh, there was a, the Idaho Human Rights Task Force up there, the Kootenai Human, Human Rights Task Force that really um, pushed uh, this lemons to lemonade campaign up there um, when the whole uh, Richard Butler and the, the whole thing was going down. Um, and so what the city of Coeur d'Alene ended up doing um, uh, when the Aryan Nation marched uh, downtown Coeur d'Alene uh, with their people, um, the whole city, uh, it was the Lemons to Lemon, Lemonade campaign, the whole city opened up everything for free to divert all the attention from that group of people. Um, so movies were going for free, the bowling alleys were going for free, they were having events all over the city. Um, and then the compound went down out in Hayden, and it really wasn't even that big of a compound, it was so inflated, there was like a couple people living up there. I remember driving by it once to go look at it and be like, it's a house on some acreage. Um, but the leaders were there and they would have people come in and do their like, you know, their conferences and that sort of thing. And then the, and then the neo-Nazi groups, um, I had a good friend that I went to high school with, her name um, was Stacy, she was, she was Mexican. Um, and they really targeted her parents' house. They would leave flyers um, on her parents' cars and stuff and tell them to get the heck out of town and, and different things like that. And, um, so, you know, it's been this interesting wave um, to watch Coeur d'Alene kind of develop over the last couple of years. My mom still lives up there. I go visit her every once in a while. Um, all three of us kids bailed. Um, I came down here, my sister's in San Francisco, my brother's in Portland, but my mom is staying up there. So it's been really interesting because, uh, you know, they are conservative. We lost all those seats up there. <laughs> they are, they're all Republican now. Um, and, the redistricting, there's so many factors that contribute to that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been interesting to watch Coeur d'Alene fight back because I think, I think ultimately um, there's a, a really good group of people that, that believe discrimination is wrong um, uh, for any reason out there. But Coeur d'Alene uh, was one of the first cities, Mike Kennedy um, was one of the city councilmen, um, that that pushed the non-discrimination ordinance up there. Uh, they it's it's interesting when you get into nonpartisan politics, right? You can kind of hide. Uh, so municipal races are nonpartisan, so you're not Democrat, you're not Republican. So uh, a lot of times we can get a lot of uh, like progressive and liberals in those city council seats um, because they're not declaring their political affiliation. Um, and, and so that's been really helpful on the non-discrimination um, front uh, uh, statewide. Um, there's a lot of prominent Boise City Council people that identify as Democrats. Um, and that was one of the reasons we were able to get it pushed. Like I said, Democratic lens, um, we were able to get it, get it through in Boise. Um, Caldwell, I don't think we have the votes yet. I did actually run for city council in 2017, got within a couple hundred votes of a win. Um, haven't decided if I'm gonna run again or stick with the Senate seat. Um, that was a, a major factor of me wanting to run for city council is to push a non-discrimination ordinance, but there was a lot of other things, affordable housing. Um, I, I see destination Caldwell is beautiful. I think we're um, ignoring a lot of of uh, important people in Caldwell um, that need to be pushed forward. And anyway, so long story short, I think, am I answering your question? I'm like on tangent city over here. <laughs> Let's talk about everything. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of what happened in Coeur d'Alene is that there was, a, there was a bunch of people on the city council that, that were in support. 
we could do it here in Caldwell. We just need a few more votes. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> Anything uh, else? Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, if you want that lens, I'm like, what can you can I do as a gay person to make me for, feel more welcome? Really, um, we need to talk to our elected officials. So that means District 10 here. Um, some of us are District 11 out in Caldwell, um, and call call our elected officials and tell them like, hey, I'm worried about these people in my community. Um, if if one way we can go about it is we can pass a non-discrimination ordinance with the with the Caldwell City Council, and that would be um, contacting your city city council members and being like, hey, listen, like we're we're missing out and and we're being harmful to people. Um, Especially, it's interesting because in College of Idaho, I didn't realize um, this nice little pocket we have at College of Idaho, Chelsea. I was like literally terrified to move here, and Chelsea is thinking I'm nuts because um, she's like, No, it's great. I went to see if I, there's all these great people. And I'm like, But they hate gay people. And that's the, right? Like, that's the, what you think if you live in the north end of Boise, where I came from, and you move out to Caldwell, um, where there's no non discrimination ordinance. So, talk to uh, your, your community leaders. Um, I mean, that's huge. Um, whenever you see anything you don't believe is right, talk to the people making those decisions and run for office. I mean, you don't have to be anything special. I have an art degree <laughs> to run for office. Um, so I'm an out of the box thinker, uh, you know, and, and, and be, be the change that you want to see, basically. And don't be afraid to call out injustices. I mean, that was one of the reasons that I, w I ran for city council is because I took a look at that destination, Caldwell. And I love that Caldwell is developing downtown. And I love that we have the flying M and that ribbon. But the other side of the tracks, man, nobody is focusing on them. Nobody is. Caldwell is what, like 37% uh, Latino. Um, if you look at the demographics, there's more people that have, uh, like only 10% of the population graduated college. Like people are struggling and they're struggling hard. And we're building downtown Caldwell up to be great. But when you go down there, who do you see down there? I mean, you see, you don't see the people of Caldwell. You see the top people of Caldwell. Um, and, and I have a hard time with it. And that's why, I mean, that's why I decided to run for city council. There's a lot of people that we're ignoring here. Um, so yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> Actually, I think that's a pretty good question that we can open up to the entire panel. Um, what can we do as allies or people who are of these groups which are discriminated against or minority groups, what can we do to support or, um, you know, advocate for our causes? I don't have an answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, so are you asking about any particular cause or just in general? Uh, just in general. Okay, so I think on my front, what I see that individuals can do um, is kind of just be brave and have empathy and tell your story. Um, so something that we work on at Interfaith Council a lot is um, learning how to share interfaith and faith stories. So what I talked about with my brother is an example of that kind of story of what motivates interfaith efforts. Um, but we also talk about um, times that we've had positive interactions with people of um, a faith or non-faith background different than our own. And I think what I've learned is that by sharing your personal experience, that can m create very direct connections with the person you're talking to. And those alliances are very strong. Um, and so the way we've been thinking about things with Interfaith Council is that we really want what we're doing to last. Um, so we haven't put a lot of efforts into doing big events um, or trying to be like too showy um, and we need to do a better job of advertising ourselves but it's very purposeful because we want to forge a lot of close relationships that are really going to last and sustain the group and each other. 
Um, and so I think everybody can do that in their own lives. Um, and that can be a way to support people who are different from you and have them supporting you as well. So that's one piece of advice I would give. You're looking at me. Um, <laughs> Um, I think I think there is there is enormous value in um, personal connections. Um, I think when when we actually talk to each other, um, when we connect with each other on an individual basis, the questions about otherness and so forth diminish significantly. And I think that's demonstrated over and over and over again. But I think in addition to sort of personal connections, I, there is something very important about questioning. Um, questioning the world that we live in, um, rejecting the idea that what is now is the only possible place. I think it is important that um, as, especially here at, at the College of Idaho and, and what we tout is the notion of critical thinking. And so always asking questions um, and imagination that, that the, that, um, Issues of injustice and issues of discrimination, issues of hatred, um, are not born from just one individual. Those kinds of processes are sustained over time because people are not asking questions. And hatred, um, um, discrimination persists because we are not rejecting those um, behaviors. And so I think there is a macro, there is something to be said for macro as well as micro. Individual connections are important, but don't accept that this world, the way that we live and the way that we um, exist is the only possible alternative. Um, demand better of yourself, but also of your parents, of your friends, of your relatives, and of your government officials. <laughs> especially them, <laughs> but demand more from them. Demand that they reflect, um, uh, reflect, reflect the core values of justice. Right? Um. I would echo everything that the three ladies said. Um, one thing I would also uh, recommend is, um, is just recognize um, who, who is in your sphere of influence, and it's everybody, especially now that we have social media. Um, you know, absolutely be brave and uh, be that challenging voice uh, amongst the people that you really care and love. And, um, you know, Van mentioned, you know, the, the compound up in northern Idaho that was knocked down, and Marilyn Schuler, who was the longtime director of the Idaho Human Rights Commission, gets a lot of credit for that. And as lovely as that was, it's much harder uh, to address issues of discrimination when they reside in the people that you love and care about. That's easy. That's a bad, that's a bad guy, it's a bad thing. Of course people are gonna clap for you because you took on that bad thing. It's much harder when you're addressing your beloved mayor. When it's much harder when you're addressing your beloved mom, your boss, your colleagues, your friends. No one's gonna clap for you when you do that. Um, I, I'll use myself as an example. You know, we, you know, social media is a wonderful thing but unfortunately, it's curated. So we're showing the best parts of our lives and the most exciting, and you know, even we did. It's like, hello, here we are with our Yodis, you know? <laughs> I mean, and, and it's, it's fun. Um, and so one of the things that, that I've done is tell the, tell the truth, and I'm glad Arnold asked this question earlier, you know, what has, been, what has it been like to be on city council? It, it is a huge honor. Um, but that disrupted the reality for many people. And in my case, it meant that I could no longer continue in my workplace. Uh, I worked for an organization where um, I, was a I was a paralegal, 
And um, so I talked to victims of domestic violence and tried to help them get legal assistance, tried to get private attorneys to offer their services free of charge to help these folks. And, um, you know, the doctor is right. You know, we have these systems and it's difficult to put it on one person. Having said that though, one person can make a difference. And that person for me was my supervisor. When I told my supervisor in 2017, guess what boss, I'm gonna run for city council. Her immediate reaction was, that's amazing. Can I tell you about the F-35? And I realized that it takes a lot of self-assuredness and security in your own ability, in your own place in the world to have an underling, a subordinate, tell you, I'm gonna strive for something way up here. Um, and for that person to have that kind of positive, encouraging, enthusiastic response. So not only was she supportive, um, I didn't realize until after she left in February of last year that she had been running interference for me with the higher ups. And so when she left, my world completely changed. I then became the victim of workplace bullying. Um, had nothing to do with my work product, had everything to do with the fact that I was a lowly paralegal who had the nerve to run for office, to win, and to beat a white male lawyer who was picked by the mayor. And um, who, who did I think I was? And my supervisors made it their job for 10 months to remind me of my proper place in the world. And um, until I couldn't take it anymore. And after 10 months, I had an emotional breakdown. I had to go to the doctor. And the doctor said, your heart rate is off the charts, your blood pressure is off the charts, and I'm looking at your records here and that's not normal for you. So you're going on two weeks sick leave. And I did, and I saw a therapist, and the therapist said to me, there's nothing wrong with you. There's a lot wrong with the people around you. And um, after two weeks, I went back to the doctor. Doctor checked my vitals again, said heart rate's normal, blood pressure's normal. Do you think it's gonna stay that way if you go back to work? I said, I don't think so. She said, I don't think so either. Um, you're, you're not returning to that job. So as I sit before you, I am living off my city council salary and unemployment. That's the reality of what happens when you dare to step out of line because we don't talk about social class in this country. We talk about racism and all the other isms, but it's this dirty secret. We don't like to talk about social class. And that's what happened, is I dared to step outside of my social class and to think that I could be at the table with people who are better than me based on their socioeconomic status and their social class. So that's the other thing, is recognize that. Educate yourself about the realities of what it means, what it meant for someone like Martin Luther King to do what he did. That is why he was killed, because he dared to address the issues of social class. He was bringing together poor people across racial lines to stand up against those in power. That's why he was taken out. That's still an issue today. <laughs> well, I, I, I bought this really great house. Um, it's on the boulevard. I hear the professor that lived there before me is just like Superman on campus, so I did learn that. Um, I learned, I bought the Mons house, in case you were curious why I was saying all that. Um, I learned that I was scared for no reason, <laughs> for, primarily. Um, that Caldwell has a terrible rap everywhere else in the state. Um, 
I got a call from the Press Tribune a couple weeks ago. They actually asked me, they were like, hey, we heard you moved from the North End to Caldwell. And they, they were like, hey, what do you, do you like it? And I'm like, yeah. I learned a lot of stuff. I learned there's a lot of stuff that needs to change. Um, I, there's a lot of really awesome things here. Um, I love, that was one thing I forgot. In Coeur d'Alene, you know, it was comparable size to Caldwell. Um, and it was a pretty close-knit community. Um, it was a college town, North Iowa College, not, not the prestigious C of I. Um, but you got to know your neighbors, um, and you got to know the local businesses, and you got to know, uh, you know the people at the grocery store when you go check out at Albertsons, and that was um, something I missed living in Boise. Um, and something I did find here. I remember the first time I ran into someone I knew at Albertsons, I got in my car and cried because I was like, I belong here. Like, it's okay, I'm okay. And it was tough. I mean, it was a, it was, it was a tough transition. Um, there's still a few things that like bother me. Like, I can't find everything I want and immediately. Like, sometimes I have to go shop in Nampa. <laughs> when I lived in Boise, that was never an issue. There, I could find anything I wanted at any point in time. Um, but I learned that I, I, I was wrong and I, uh, for being scared. And I learned, um, you know, in my city council race, um, I got to know a lot of the, the councilmen and I learned that um, a lot of their, they, they think they're coming from a good place and they're doing the best that they can from what they know um, in the world that they've experienced. Um, and um, it's, up to us to show them that there's other people <laughs> that matter. Um, and I learned the same in my, my uh, Senate race. I, I ran against Jim Rice, who in 2015 kicked me out of one of his town hall meetings because I defended refugees, uh, the refugee resettlement pro pro uh, program here in Idaho. And he told me to get out. Um, and when the opportunity arose, I was like, well, I'm going to run against this dude. Um, and and I actually sat next to him at the Press Tribune, and, and I was like, you're going to kick me out of here? I don't think you have the authority. Um, and he laughed, and, I, and he's like, this is going to be fun. I'm like, yeah, we disagree on pretty much everything. Um, believes marijuana makes you hallucinate. Whatever, it's fine. Um, so I learned, uh, I learned that, that I, I was not... I was more afraid than I needed to be, and that most of the people I've met have, uh, like, they want to do good, um, and, and they want to do good for their community. So that's what I learned in my Bullfrey my City Council race. I also learned when I was knocking the 2,500 doors, everybody is really pissed off about the roads and the winter where the, uh, the snow plows did not run. So, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you for the broadest question. Um, <laughs> so I think, well, um, I think I think history gives us gives us important lessons about possibilities and the way that human behaviors and communities um, and individuals, but also at a, at a state and, and, and regional level, can really change things. Um, I think one of the probably the most important lesson is that sometimes change can come in ways that are completely unexpected. Um, that it is almost impossible for us to predict those things that will foster movement. Um, we know that there, you know, for example, the civil rights movement, of course, did not start in the 1960s. It started um, 19, 1865, right, about, right after the Civil, um, um, civil War, um, when um, newly freed Black Americans were denied basic rights. Um, we know that um, multiple efforts um, for a century, right, um, that, that there was very limited change. How things converge, right, in the way that it does, 
um, and how rapidly move, we move towards like the Voting Rights Act, um, that those things give us clues that change does happen. Sometimes it happens over, sometimes it doesn't happen immediately. And um, sometimes we have to fight for decades, for centuries, but it does happen. So again, this is what I was saying earlier about um, the possibility, the, thinking about the fact that the world that we live in today is not the only possible variation. Um, that human capacity for change is evident throughout all of our histories. We just have to also act on it. Um, complacency is not, is not a choice. Um, and as uh, Dr. King said, sort of move things, shake things up. Right? Make things, make people uncomfortable. Um, making people uncomfortable, feeling uncomfortable is not a bad thing. That is, I think, critical to any kind of social, political change. Um, so I think we should not be afraid to be uncomfortable. I think we should not be afraid to feel pain. And I also think that we should not be afraid to challenge others to feel pain. Um, and discomfort. Um, those are actually very important things. So, yes. <laughs> Sorry, Alex. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and again, thank you for challenging us to tell the truth right now. Um, I did not grow to appreciate being of Mexican descent until I got to college. And that was because growing up in Burley, um, the messages I received from the community at large and um, the fact that we were invisible at school uh, made me feel like that was something I needed to overcome, that being Mexican was not something to be proud of, that it was something that I needed to minimize. Um, and it wasn't until I got to Boise State where we had wonderful instructors and counselors um, like Alma Gomez. Alma Gomez um, is an instructor at Boise State in the art department, and she's an award-winning artist here in Idaho. Um, and she's a counselor with the College Assistance Migrant Program. Thanks to Alma, who introduced people like me, people of Mexican descent, um, about all the different aspects of being Mexican, of being Chicana, to be proud of, I had no idea. I was 21 years old the first time I ever read anything written by a Mexican. Um, and I still remember what it was. Uh, back in the day, we didn't have Barnes and Noble in Boise, Idaho, or, or Borders. We had this rinky-dink bookstore called Book Star. Does anybody remember Book Star? <laughs> and I remember <laughs> going to Book Star, and they had one book in the Hispanic section. But I'm so grateful for that one book. Um, it, it, was in, it was an anthology of poetry entitled After Aslan, Latino Poets of the 90s. And the very first poem um, was written by my favorite uh, poet, Francisco X. Alarcón, um, called In a Neighborhood in Los Angeles. And what the poem was about, it was about his childhood as a little boy uh, growing up in LA and what it was like when his parents had to go work at the fish canneries, how they would drop him off at his grandmother's house, uh, in her, leaving him in her care while they went to work. And so he described his memories. They were all sensory, the smells, the sights, the sounds of, of his grandmother. That was the very first time I had ever seen my life directly accurately reflected, because I was raised by my grandmother while my mom worked. And it, it changed my life. It, it made me immediately feel that we mattered, because 
you know, we live in this society that unless, unless there's a picture of you, um, unless you're reflected in the movies or on television or you're, or, or, or you're reflected in the pages of the book, you don't exist. You don't matter. What are you? And so, yes, I, I would say, yeah, there was a period of time where I did feel embarrassed. I, I, I didn't have a quinceañera. Um, I felt doing something like that, I would be a fraud because I didn't feel Mexican enough. You know, I don't know how to make tortillas. Uh, I'm not married. I don't have children. These are all the messages that I received growing up of what it meant to be Mexican. And I didn't want those things. So maybe it meant that I didn't want to be Mexican. And I enjoyed school. And the message I received um, growing up in Burley was that if you liked school, you wanted to be white. So I'm so grateful for Boise State. I'm grateful for Alma. You know, I'm grateful for Arnold. You know, that if you happen to make it to college, not only was the possibility of earning a degree so that you could participate at a higher level in the society a possibility, in our case, it was also an opportunity to know who you were and to know where you come from and to fall in love with yourself and your culture. <laughs>